Um, I I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Hello and welcome to another episode of Inspired by Yarra. This is the podcast created to enhance, connect and inspire the Yarra Valley Grammar community and beyond. So (laughs) wherever you're listening from today, I want to say thank you for tuning in. Thanks for being part of this community. My name's Paul Joy and I'm delighted to present another conversation with a Yarra old grammarian, a yog. And we're going to work our way through the twists and turns and ups and downs, the roller coaster ride of school life and then what comes after that. Today we're going to tap into the world of elite sport as we chat with Steph Puapolo from the class of 2009. I'm going to begin our conversation today by asking her when she first arrived at Yarra. Tell us a little bit about that and can you recall the school uniform that you were wearing? Yeah, so I vividly remember starting at Yarra because I moved across to Yarra Valley Grandma in, at the beginning of year nine. So I was a little bit of a latecomer. And I remember being very nervous on my first day. I, I knew a couple of girls in my year level that I played basketball with. But I guess, as you can imagine, coming into a new school anytime is daunting, but especially once everyone else in year level year level has had two years to mould their friendship groups and get to know everyone. So it was pretty daunting. But it was also really exciting because I had a pretty crappy time, excuse the language, but in my first two years in high school at my previous school, I I just didn't it wasn't the right fit for me. I um yeah, I I, str- I didn't enjoy going to school. I um, would struggle with my work in terms of getting it in on time and things like that. My motivation for school was really challenged at my first high school. And the prospect of a new start at a new school at somewhere like Yarra Valley Grammar was extremely exciting for me. And um, I'm pretty sure we had a whole school assembly my first day. And that was awesome. And it was Yarra Valley Grammar was, is a lot bigger than my previous high school. And that, that was just a huge experience in itself and gave me a really good insight initially into what the school was about and, and, you know, all the beautiful, wonderful opportunities that the school had. Um, and I instantly became a completely new student when I moved to Yarra Valley Grammar, never wanted to miss a day, had everything in on time, was studious, just, I loved it. I, yeah. And from the very first day I could tell I was going to, and it just, Kind of almost, this sounds really lame, but it ignited a bit of a spark in me for school again, which was really exciting. That's an amazing transformation. I wonder, what was the conversation like that first night when you came home and maybe you have a family dinner and you're sitting around the table and you get to share some stories? What what What's that conversation like? Because there's obviously a huge commitment to change schools, as you say, midway through into year nine. It's a massive year level to come into. And it hadn't been a great experience at your previous school. And all of a sudden, you've come home with a smile on your face. That must be such a blessing for your family. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's a long time ago now, so I can't remember exactly what was spoken about at the dinner table. But I, I imagine it would have been a big relief for my parents because I, I from memory, mum used to have to write me all sorts of late notes for my other school. And, you know, sorry, she hasn't heard this in and she's late to school and, Um, I wasn't a naughty student by any means, but I just struggled with motivation for school because I just didn't enjoy the environment I was in. So I I imagine the, um, the relief for my mum and dad when they realized this transition is going to be good would be, would have been huge because it just meant there was no burden on them to have to really give me that kick up the bum to, you know, get excited for school. So I I imagine they would have felt a huge amount of relief and excitement for me as well. For sure. It's, uh, I mean, uh, and I think anybody who, even at the time, some people at the school would have known part of that story. 
And so for them to be able to have heard part of what you've come from and then for you to come in and, and almost instantaneously, it sounds, brighten up and become the young girl who your parents probably knew was in you and now you're still at school, a different school, and all of a sudden you just come alive. That is, that's exciting. I've got goosebumps. It's one. <laughs> yeah, and I also felt very grateful to be going to a school like Yarra Valley Grammar because um, I, it was the, the idea of p- potentially moving me there actually came from a conversation that my mum had with um, she, my mum and dad have, quite involved with coaching. So dad coaches athletics, mum coaches netball. And mum had a conversation with one of the parents of the girls that she coached at the time and um, their children went to pegs. So he said, why not, you know, try, we obviously lived in the eastern side. He's like, why not try somewhere like Yarra Valley Grammar? Because I obviously had the sporting side that could have helped me. And um, I, I gained a spot at Yarra Valley Grammar on a general excellence scholarship. So I... To be at that school, that would never have been a prospect for my family if it hadn't have been for the opportunity to have a scholarship like that. So I just felt instantly grateful to have the opportunity to go to a school like Yarra Valley Grammar as well. So that played a big part in it too. It's a pretty... uh a pretty solid foundation upon which to start, you know, knowing Mm. straight away that gratitude is part of your character to be able to come to a school like Yarra and uh, and to then, as you said, on day one to see the opportunities, to see the potential that was right there and now it's within your grip is really, really exciting. You did also mention, though, that coming in is challenging. You know, many of the friendships have connected and, and people are kind of already in their groove. Who were the people that you did break into in terms of who were your people, who were your crowd, where did you hang? <laughs> I think I was very lucky with my year level because there was there's always your groups of like groups of friendships friendship groups um but our year level had this really cool like respect for everybody you know whether you might be hanging out with someone that's not technically in your normal friendship group but there was just just really and I, I think it evolved and by the time we got into year 12 it was really a thing you know there was that general respect across the whole year level that you could go and chat to a different group and and you felt welcome and that was I think really um, unique to a school and the school year level and I imagine that doesn't happen in every year level but um Initially, as I mentioned before, I I knew Leah Motten and Elisa Watson. I played basketball with them. So that was sort of my first, I like, they were the only people I knew of at the school. So um, naturally you gravitate to some those people that you know. So that was sort of my starting point. And because I was so heavily involved with sport and played, loved my Saturday sport and played a lot of sport outside of school, um, the, the sporty group, I guess <laughs> you could probably explain it as. Um, so I often would find myself on the oval kicking the footy with the boys sometimes at lunchtime once I found my groove. And, um, yeah, so I, I definitely, the sporting group, all the, the, the girls and boys that were involved in sport would probably my, my main group of friends. And I'm not saying that it's easy, but having some natural ability, some affinity for uh, physical interaction in terms of sport um, does help, doesn't it? In terms of if you can prove your worth on the sporting field, if you can throw and catch and bounce and, you know, shoot the goals and that there is a certain level of credibility that you gain fairly quickly, particularly when it comes to Saturday sport. Um, What sort of sports did you get involved in for Yarra? Um, yeah, I agree with, with your point there in terms of, um, it does make it easier because I guess you're, you're put into a team and that's a really quick and easy way to make friendships and get to know people, um, in a safe environment as well. And it gives you something to speak about and talk about, you know, um, that starting point. So, um, I, I feel really grateful that sport can provide that as well. And that, that environment, that safe environment to, to start those foundations as a friendship, um, I played uh, winter, winter, my winter sport was netball uh, and coming into Yarra Valley Grammar, I played a lot of netball. I've been playing netball ever since I can remember. Um, 
but I have vivid, vivid memories of Mary Carroll when I started. She was obviously so excited to have me, which was awesome and very welcoming. But I remember um, one lunchtime, she's like, right, meet me down at the sports complex. I'm going to teach you how to play volleyball. And so she, I would literally go down at lunchtime and she would just hit a volleyball at me. And I learned volleyball from scratch just with Mary Carroll. And it ended up being, I ended up, um, obviously didn't go straight into being an amazing volleyballer by any means, but I can't, I think it would have been maybe by year 10 or 11, I made my way into the first team for volleyball and ended up playing a year of state league volleyball as well. And that was literally all thanks to Mary Carroll. And if it wasn't for her getting me down there and hitting the volleyball at me and making me realize how much of a fun sport it was, um, I never would have played volleyball if it wasn't for having a a summer sport that I had to choose. Uh, um, So I, again, feel very grateful that I got that opportunity through Yarra. Yeah. But to be fair, there are a number of um, yogs who have spoken and shared with us here on, on this podcast who have spoken very fondly of their, um, I guess, of being identified within our sports department at the time of somebody who had a bit of potential uh, and they offered them some opportunities. And Mary Carroll uh, is certainly one of them who we hear about rather regularly and with no disregard or disrespect to Mary Carroll, she's one of our biggest fans, and I think it might be because she gets a mention fairly often. <laughs> Hello, Mary. Hello, Mary. <laughs> I, I wonder whether um, you can tell us a little bit about the value of team because obviously team sports was a, a big part of your experience. Tell me a little bit about contributing to the team and, and how you feel, that whether there's a responsibility for that what do you do or how do you handle people or teammates who aren't contributing, whether that's at a school level, at a sporting level, that perhaps is part of your experience, but also even at a at a work level, at a professional level. Tell us a little bit about teams. Yeah, I, interesting point because I think being part of a team is one of the the biggest and most crucial parts of growing up. And you learn so much than you ever realize until you get into adulthood and you're like, oh, I'm so glad I was part of a team because you get into the corporate world and you have to work in teams. And if you can't, it makes it very challenging. So I have had a lot of, uh, a lot of times of reflection recently where I've thought, I'm so grateful for, the, for what I learned, both in being part of a team at school being part of elite teams, elite sporting teams after finishing school. There are so many things that I'm now realising I have learnt at, at just by being part of a team. And I just think um, learning to be able to, I think the biggest one is learning to be able to work with a big variety of personalities. A team is all, all you're never the same person, how boring it would be if you were. But having that opportunity um as a child, as a young person, you probably don't realise that you're doing that. You, you sort of just, you mould to your environment and you, and you, you learn along the way. And then when, when you're an adult and you're part of a team, you realise, oh, you learn more about different quirks in people's personality and how to work with them and how to get the best out of them. And there's obviously lots of, um, I learned a lot about leadership along the way as well. And, if it wasn't for being part of a team, I don't think I would be where I am now in my job, to be honest, because I I have sort of joined the corporate world later than most people. Um, my 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 finishing my degree kind of was a bit delayed because of team sport, um, and I've sort of probably progressed quicker as a result of what I've learnt in my my years of being part of team sports. We're speaking with Steph Puopolo from the class of 2009. And Steph, you've just shared some uh, beautiful recollections of the value of team. And I think you're right. I think actually what happens is when you're a young person, when you're a kid, some of those getting along with other people and cheering each other on in a sporting context, they just come naturally because you want to do well, you want to um play the best you can and you know that in order for you to do well actually you've got to cheer on your teammate and help them to do their best as well and that that is one of the great life lessons that that sport does offer you did have an affinity with sport and we've heard a little bit about 
volleyball and uh, and the opportunity to play that at an elite level. Your other sport probably was netball. Can you tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about that journey? And and maybe let's start with the highest of highs. At what level did you play netball? And maybe what's a particular moment that you can remember that was significant? Yeah, well, in terms of picking uh, the most significant moment in my netball is pretty easy for me. Um, one that sticks in my mind straight away is captaining the Australian 21 and under team. And um, we... We played a three-match series against the New Zealand 21 and under team in New Zealand as part of being part of that team. Uh, We lost the first – I was – to give you some context, I was one of the younger members, so I was only 19, and I was appointed captain, um, which was completely – well, it was unexpected because of my age, and I remember talking to my mum and dad about whether to even put my hand up for the role. And mum and dad sort of said, well, why not? It's a good experience just to go through the process. And then I was awarded with captaincy, which is just in itself is a huge, one of my hugest honour in terms of being involved in in netball. Um, But what was really cool was um, I didn't didn't make an appearance on the court at all in the first game. And I was um, being captain, that's challenging. Um, And, but I was also aware that, it was an Australian team. It was full of very, very talented people. And it didn't, being captain didn't mean I could just walk onto the court, especially, you know, my age and experience and all of that. Um, and then I managed to get myself a spot on the court in the, the second game. We won the second game and, and I played the full game. And then again in the third game and um, we won the series. So we were down one to nil and then we won the second two games and won the series. Um, and, it was just cool. It was just an awesome experience and I will never forget it. And I, uh, yeah, I, I just feel so privileged to have captained an Australian side, albeit an underage side. Um, and the group of girls was like a lot of them have gone on to play and be very successful at the Suncorp super level and at the national level at, in an open age. And to have captained that group and be part of that team was is super inspiring because it was just a really, really great group of girls. It was, yeah, I don't, I don't know how else to explain it. it. It was, that's definitely my biggest highlight. Yeah, too right. And and I wonder, just a reflection from me, it tells me a lot about the culture of the under-21 Australian netball team to for them to appoint a captain who's who's at the younger age of the of the group, of the playing group, but also that it's not just a presumption that the captain is going to field the court on on the first match, which I love that, that it's just not a walk-up start. Even though you wear a badge, even though you you have a title, doesn't mean it's an automatic start. I love that culture Mm. that that tells us. But I wonder whether you might reflect for a moment on leadership and leading those girls, many of whom were older than you, and as you say, it was a somewhat of a surprise, a great honour, no doubt. But what does it take to lead at an elite level of people who perhaps are, are maybe better than you and have more experience than you? What does it mean to be the captain? It's hard to put into words, really. And I probably can't remember a whole lot of the, the nitty gritty detail of of how I like that, you know, what I said to them and those sort of things. And I think leadership is such a, a complex uh, topic because there's so many theories, there's so many ways to lead, there's so many, you know, it's a really, it's a complex thing. Um, and the older I get, the more I realise that. Um, and I think for me back then it was about leading by example and maintaining a standard. So Coming from Victoria, the Victorian netball culture as a junior was you never left the court unless the drill was completed correctly. Like you, you ne- there was you never dropped the standard. So I had that drilled into me from a young young girl, and that was those two things are probably my the biggest maybe the biggest reasons why I ended up with that that captaincy was you know I was not afraid to maintain the standard and uphold the team to that standard. And I, yeah, I always tried to lead by example. So they're, they're probably my two 
two biggest things. And, and I mean, I was so young, I was 19. So there's probably a lot to my leadership style that has evolved since then. Um, but thinking back to where I was at at that stage, they're probably my two biggest things. Mm. But obviously somebody saw something in you that said, yes, we think these shoulders can carry this burden and this responsibility. And you obviously had a, a really, really strong work ethic, you as an individual, both on the sporting uh, court and, and field and training arena. Did that apply to your schooling as well? Did you uh, work as hard in in the classroom as such as you did on the sports field or, or were you one of those? And, and there are many, and this is not a criticism, but there are some who just live to get out there at lunchtime and after school training and it's all about Saturday sport. But how did you go back in the classroom? I very much so applied that to my classroom as well. And I think, um, again, two completely different people didn't at my old, my previous high school, but it was all about getting out in the sports field and wanting to play netball. Moving to Yarra, and I think this comes back into the being grateful to have the opportunity to go to Yarra Valley Grammar and the opportunities available, I felt like I, I couldn't let the ball drop at all. In, and, and it kind of gave me that extra motivation to put just as much into my schooling work as I did into my sport. And I'm also very much the type of person that I'm either all or nothing So if I can't put everything into something, I don't want to do it. (laughs) So I, um, I definitely applied and, uh, and I guess the whole, the, the real, um, I have to work hard to, I had to work hard to get the grades I got to, to, like, I, I, I'm not naturally gifted that I can just read something once and it'll stick in my brain. Like I have to, so I, yeah, I, my work ethic definitely transferred across once I moved to Yarra Valley. And it sounds like, as you were describing, that the training drills and, and continuing to, to stick with it and motivating others to stick with it until you got it the way it was meant to be performed, if you apply that, and it sounds like you did to your academics, it sounds like you would do whatever it takes to be the best you could be, both on the court and also off the court in the classroom and so forth. Um, and I think that that's certainly something that many young people today aspire to, But we find it difficult to have both, to do it all. How did you, how was your day structured? How did you fit it all in? Because if you're, (laughs) if you're the captain of the under 21s at age 19, you're not far out of school by that point. So you would have been playing at a very high level in your senior years of school. Did, did school give a little bit to allow that to happen or did you fit everything in and how how did that work and who do you who do you regard well, like was it lots of trips in the car to training to here to there is it parents is it did you get really good at negotiating the bus network how did you manage it all <laughs> i very i'm very grateful my mum and my dad my dad did do a lot, lot of driving as well but mostly my mum we spent a lot of time in the car together <laughs> We, um, I, I still remember mum would be waiting for me at, out the front gate and I'd run down to the car and I'd get changed in the car just to get to training on time. And, um, yeah, it was, it, I had not, not much spare time <laughs> to put it plainly. I, I sure there were probably days where school homework may have, you know, been missed or, um, I might've left stuff to the, to the last minute which I tend to has somewhat carried through to my adulthood. I think, I think I like the pressure of it because I was so used to being under time pressure all the time in school that now I sort of default to that. I'm like, yes, give me the time pressure. I'll get things done then. Um, I think, yeah, I learned to just get things done as as best I could with the time I had. Um, There were lots of late nights as well. I remember in year 12, I, I had a couple of near all nighters to get work done um and to get my study done and yeah lots of late nights and big days Mm, mm. is there a a particular subject or maybe even a piece of work an assignment a project something that you you did invest the time and the effort and the energy and you were really proud of it something whether it would be the result or maybe the result didn't reflect your own sense of satisfaction for getting it done I probably have two examples on both spectrums for that. 
I loved business management in year 11 and 12, loved it. And I put so much time into the study and and my result in the end probably didn't reflect what I felt like I'd put in for it. It wasn't a bad result by any means. I can't even remember exactly what I got for my last um, exam, but it didn't. I didn't feel like it reflected what I the the time and the, the, how much I loved that subject. On the other spectrum, I in year I think it must have been year ten or eleven. I had obviously English, one of our the subjects we have to do. I, I didn't mind English. I did okay at English. Year 12, it was my favorite subject. I I think it was a lot to do with my teacher and I feel terrible. I can't remember her name. I'm terrible with names. She changed my world in terms of English and it ended up becoming my best subject, my most favorite subject and has shaped a lot of what I did in uni and what I'm good at now. And I, uh, my year 12 um, English exam was like a huge breakthrough for me. And I remember we, it was a three hour exam and I don't know if it's changed since, but it's huge. You have to write three essays. And I remember if I, if you had to ask me at the beginning of year 12, what would your best subject be? I never would have chosen English, um, but it was, and it was so rewarding. And I love writing now and not creative writing. I'm not a creative writer, but I, I love, yeah. So, and I ended up studying PR and journalism. <laughs> right. So, yes. Yeah. Which is all about communication and words and, and you know, transferring that information. And uh, so salute and hats off and I will find out who your year 12 yeah, teacher was. I and feel I'll... terrible for not remembering. Can you let me know? I, na- names are not my strong point. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's that's a beautiful reflection though, and uh, and I thank you for it. I wonder whether there is a place at Yarra Valley Grammar that holds particular memories. It might be uh, the first time you ate a uh, vanilla slice, or it might be the first time you took a a mark in front of the pack of boys who were playing footy, or it might be that the time you stood on stage and you gave a speech or you sang a song or you, is there a particular place that holds memories for you? I think there's a few. I think definitely the sports complex. I spent a lot of time down there, both in winter and summer and that sports comp. And I also spent a lot of time there outside school hours because the netball team I played for trained there. So I, I, that place will always hold a special place in my heart because I spent purely spent so much time there and had some of the most fun and awesome games of netball, awesome games of volleyball, um, lots of good memories. And then um, another one would be the Performing Arts Centre because of I just think that that building has so much character and it has this like amazing aura about it and so many important things happen there and I guess the importance for me would be, you know, um, there was some really, really interesting assemblies we had there, but then also um, the times where I, I did have to present on stage a couple of times, which was so nerve wracking, but a cool experience. And then also, you know, getting presented there as a prefect and a captain and, and you know, they're very, very special moments. So that that building will all, all, always hold a special place in my heart. And then the CAF, because I love food. So I, I I remember plenty of fun lunch times there and the, the pasta, the bowls of pasta we used to get. And then in summer we used to have the, the frozen juice cups. I don't know if I still do them there. And we'd all have the, the plastic knives and we'd try and scrape them off. And, yeah, there's just a couple of things that stick in my mind. They're good memories for sure. I wonder <laughs> whether back then did you, because you're, you're playing sport, competing at an, an elite level, did you have a, a strict regime of of diet like was that part of the training and the thinking back then or is is that sort of something that's come more recently it definitely was um but I think it wasn't as stringent because we were underage it's like so they definitely educate you on all those things as soon as you're part of the um, state pathway or national pathway um as a junior you're definitely educated and guided on those things but they're not as strictly put in place. And I think it's because the fact that you're underage, you're still, you're very formative years. It can have, if it's taken to the extreme, it can have quite, I guess, detrimental 
um, but it can also be good. Uh, so yeah, definitely education around it. And there was definitely a lot of awareness for it, but I wasn't essentially on meal plans or having, you know, being weighed often or those things did happen, but it wasn't a huge, huge focus compared to what it did end up being once I was involved as an adult, I guess. So enjoying some of the delights from the CAF was quite okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. And now I'm interested at uh, your experience now and your scenario now in regards to netball in particular. Are you still involved or are you exhausted from netball and you wanna, you've had enough, you've had your fill? That's a good question. I my it's a long long question long answer. Um, netball for me again. I've been I've been involved with netball from when I probably started walking. My mum's been a coach for a long time, and I used I've been around it my whole life. It was my be all and end all, and my one true love. All growing up. I idolized the netballers. I went to every game. I wanted to play for Australia. I It was everything. And very much the same, as, you know, the back end of school. Loved, like I obviously put a lot of focus on um, setting myself up to get into a uni degree and still have that going on in the background. But the reason why my degree took me so long to finish was because netball was number one, even once I finished school. Um, and I moved around a lot for netball and it's such an interesting space, the elite sport space, because it can either make you flourish or eat you alive, to be pretty honest. And I had, I had probably spurts of both those things. There were times where it made me flourish and there were times when it ate me alive and it got to a point, um, I I stepped away from sort of, I guess you'd call it elite, so state league level and my last season with Victorian Fury, which is the Australian Netball League. So that's still, I guess, considered elite level. Um, that is That was 2017 was my last season at that level. And the Victorian Fury season runs at the beginning of the year. So I played that season, a shorter season and I, the a &L season, and I played that at the beginning of 2017. Loved it. Still really passionate. I captained that side. We got to the grand final. It was awesome. Loved it. And then the back end of that year, it, I played state, my play, state league. Um, and I got to the end of the season and I hated it. I, I just had enough and I was putting way too much pressure on myself. Netball was actually making me anxious. I felt anxious to go to training. I felt anxious to play. I didn't enjoy it. I was exhausted because I was so emotionally just like I, it makes me emotional talk about it. Um, and I got to that end of that season. And I was like, I just, I, I can't do that anymore. Like I need, I, it's, it's eating me up. Like I, I didn't feel happy. Um, it wasn't, netball wasn't making me feel happy anymore, which was hard because it was something that made me feel happy for so long. And for it to make me feel like that was, was it nice? And um, kind of confronting because it was also all I ever knew for so long. And um, yeah, so I guess lucky, it's good timing was that I'd, that year I'd also, at the beginning of 2017 was when I finished my degree and I got a good job at Mazda. So I was um, working full time that year as well as, as juggling netball commitments. So I had, I, I often feel very grateful for that because I, I feel like the fallback of that year would have been way bigger if I hadn't have persisted with my degree throughout that time and, and have that to sort of go back to once netball wasn't my one, my one main thing anymore. Um, so yeah, that, that year was, it was hard. And then 2018, I was like, nope, I'm, I'm not playing any netball. I need a complete break from it. I don't, I don't, I don't want a bar of it anymore. I'm just going to have a complete year off. And then my partner who I met my partner, um, the beginning of 2017. So, um, he was around my last sort of year of, of net big netball. Um, and he's been really supportive through the whole thing. Um, but his sister is really into netball. 
And but he's from the country, so he's from Yarrawonga, and his sister still lives up there and plays Saturday footy netball up there. And so, of course, she was loving having someone else in the family that loves netball, and she got into my ear. She's like, come play with me in the country. Um, so I ended up, she was playing for Tokemore, which is like three and a half odd hours from from Melbourne. Um, so I ended up saying, okay, but I'm only playing if the team agrees because I couldn't commit to playing every week. And I never wanted to be that player that just comes in and plays every now and then and then plays finals. And And I said to her, I am not doing that unless the team are all happy for me to, to do that because I don't want to be that person. Anyway, she took it back to the team and she was like, yep, they're all keen. They want you to play. I was like, okay, yep, all right, let's do it. So um, 2018, I played, um, yeah, for Token Wall. So I, but I only ended up playing maybe six, six or seven games throughout the season and then we made the grand final, so played the final series. Um, and the best part was I'm traditionally a goaler, so goal attack, goal shooter, but I ended up playing mostly goalkeeper so it was fun because I had no pressure. I didn't put any, like, it was just something different and new, um, even though it was still netball. Um, so that was really fun. And then again, I got to the end of that year. I was like, no, having, this is, okay, 2019, year off completely, not doing it. Uh, and then I got a phone call from Aloise Southby, who's well known in the netball world. Um, and she's like, oh, I've had um, a club out east, Mombolk, who, who've contacted me because I did some stuff there with my dad. Um, and they're looking for a new A-grade coach. And so you, you, you and your mum are the only ones I know out that way. So I just thought before I give them your details, I wanted to check that was okay. I was like, yeah, totally fine. I'm happy to talk to them. Um, anyway, I sort of went into the, initially I spoke to the club and they're beautiful people. They're an amazing club. And initially I was like, okay, I'll do my best to find you someone. Cause I was determined not to be involved. I was like, I'm having a year off and, um, and ended up talking to mom and I was like, who can we suggest? Like, who can we get? But a lot of people that are, you know, a lot of good coaches already are affiliated with football netball clubs. So it's hard to find people and especially at outer East as well. Anyway, mum rang me one day. She's like, I'm going to do it. I'll coach. Because my, my mum's an elite netball coach. She's a really, really good netball coach. And um, I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, it'll be fun. I was like, okay, well, I'll help you, but I'm not playing. I'm definitely not playing. I'll just come and do a bit of assistant coaching and specialist coaching for the goalers and stuff. And she's like, all right, no worries. So we started off with the club and um, they're just – I could go into a whole new story about how amazing that club is. They're just wonderful. They really brought us in with open arms. And um, and I started off by going to like maybe one session a week and helping out with coaching. And then get, the girl, some of the girls were like, oh, are you going to play? I, was, I stood strong. I was like, no, no, no. Anyway, it got to round two, I think it was, and there was some sort of music festival on and half the girls were all at this music festival, so we're really low on numbers. And mum was like, I need you. Like, you need to just please just one game. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, so I agreed to play that game and I played every game after that the whole season. <laughs> and it was the best. I loved it. And I ended up going back to playing goal shooter and – I kind of found found a bit of my spark again for netball and but I think it was because it's it was about the enjoyment it was there was no pressure like there wasn't much pressure I mean we wanted to win and we ended up making the grand final and it was it was there was a huge improvement with the girls throughout the whole season um and that was probably more of a win than making the grand final but it was about the enjoyment and the girls just felt so appreciative that they had mum at the club and that I was happy to play and and it was just really nice. So, and I was gearing up to play again this season, but obviously with, with coronavirus, we haven't been able to, um, yeah, long, long answer, but thank you. No, <laughs> it's, it's been quite a it's journey. <laughs> fantastic. And thank you for taking us on that journey. And, and I, I appreciate your willingness to decide for yourself that stepping away from netball as much as that was not a natural decision that was not part of your makeup when it was no longer giving you joy when it was no longer filling you with with what you 
had previously enjoyed so much that you you tried to step away. But then it's interesting that something that's kind of built into you just gradually pulled you back in. <laughs> And you found yeah. that spark again, which is, uh, and that that's the way you said it. You know, you found that spark again, and uh, and it brought such happiness and and the the new group of people and the new club and the environment that they've created. And now you're obviously an integral part of. Is uh, it's a beautiful loop all the way back around. And uh, yeah, and thank you so much for sharing that journey with us. No worries. Yeah, and and the other nice thing is too that my partner and I live out. Um, in Mount Evelyn now, so we are close to Mombolk. So it's it's all kind of happened quite nicely because it also gives us an opportunity to build relationships in the local community as well. And, um, yeah, I think the biggest part of being involved is the community side of it and the social side of it and, and the you know, being part of that club and the, the spark, bringing the spark back of netball is kind of like the side bit. It's the, the added extra um, it's we've just really, really enjo- enjoyed being part of such a wonderful club locally. And I love it too that that for a period of time netball was the thing, but now it's the people and the the community that are around that in your new mm. season of uh, of experience, which is great. I, I, and I don't want to kind of hang around sport for too long, although I personally love it. Um, <laughs> I just wonder whether you might be able to make a comment on the the rise of professional women's sport let's take uh, WFL the the women's footy league and the notion of elite sports women being able to transition to a different sport mm. what is it about playing at an elite level or at a very high level is there is there a, an understanding of what it takes at that level to be able to then transition and be become really good at another sport altogether? Mm. Um, you know, you, you see it sometimes in families, whether it be the, the mother, the daughter and so forth, or sisters both being really good at, is there something that that family has? Is it genetics? Is it just a work ethic? What do you think it is that allows some people to be able to play maybe even multiple different disciplines at a, such a high level? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, elite sport is, unless you've actually experienced it, it's hard to actually explain what it's like. And I feel as though there is a recipe that you have to have that makes you an elite elite person. Like it, it's almost, it's almost a, a personality type, like if that makes sense. Because it sort of transfers, it's not, I'm sure if you spoke to a lot of elite athletes, they're not just elite in sport. Everything they do, they're probably elite at. So it's like a, it's a, it's the traits that you have, I think. Obviously, with elite athletes, there's a, an enormous amount of ability and athletic ability and some of that may be natural that they were born with and they've just taken it to that next level with the type of training and and, and stuff they do. But I do, I do think there's an element of having the right, the right personality traits in order to be successful in the elite environment. Because, and I, and I think that's, um, I, I think commitment is a big one because you sacrifice so much being an elite athlete, so that your level of commitment is, has to be huge. Um, you have to be, you have to be super organized. That sounds really silly, but you, you do. You have to be because you can't let things drop off. You have to be really organized in your life to be able to be successful. You also have to have an element of being a bit selfish. This there probably is the wrong word to use, but I often think that I probably didn't quite crack it in that environment for a number of reasons, but I'm not a selfish person. So I probably needed a little bit more of that. <laughs> And it's funny because we recently looked at um, my partner and I recently watched the Michael Jordan um, documentary, and that was a huge eye opener. But I mean, he's there's so much to his personality that you're like, I can see why you're so successful because, again, maintaining standard. He's like he's selfish, super selfish, but. He, he didn't let anything get in his way of what he wanted to achieve. So 
I think there's a, there's a few of those like personality traits that you need to you need to definitely have that can, then that's why it becomes transferable across different sports. Again, transferring across sports at that level is a huge like feat. Like to be able to do that, just because you're good, an elite sports person in one sport doesn't mean you're going to naturally be an elite sports sports person in another sport. So to be able to transfer your skills across like that is a huge feat, and not anyone can just do that. But uh, yeah, I'm a big believer of those those personality certain personality traits. Um, yeah, and your work ethic obviously is a big one. You you have to be prepared to work hard and push yourself outside of your comfort zone often. Um, yeah, I, I think that may be a reason why, again, we saw a lot of females transfer across from other sports because they had those foundational foundation sort of personality traits that enable them to be an elite, elite sports person. Mm-hmm. And then they can transfer wanna, them across. I don't want to jump too far and I don't want to put words into your mouth, but it seems to me, having just met you and heard a little bit about you and, and now your story, um, it seems to me that you're one out of the box, though, because you both have the commitment and the dedication, you're organised, and by your own confession, have a little bit of a selfish streak. You've played elite sport, and yet you're delightful. You're personable <laughs> and interact beautifully, and it's been a real pleasure to have you uh, as part of the Inspired by Yarra podcast. I wonder if I could take you to what we call almost the lightning round where I've got a couple of really quick fire questions for you and some of them will test your memory. Others will be absolutely, it'll just roll off the tongue. <laughs> you ready? Yep. While you, were at, yeah, while you were at Yarra, what house were you in? On it. Do you have a preference or did you have a preference, house swimming or house athletics? House athletics. Why? <clears throat> Well, my dad is an athletics coach, so he coaches um, all the throwing um, events. So I think he would have been very disappointed if I didn't do athletics. <laughs> is there a, a house drama, or, uh, sorry, not necessarily a house drama, but a, a musical or a drama, a performance that you were either involved in in the PAC or maybe you were a, a, a part of the crowd that particularly stands in mind? I definitely wasn't involved in any, as much as I would have loved to have been, definitely not one of my talents. Um, but I did go to a few, but I, for the life of me, can't remember what they were, what they were called. I, but I always was in awe of how good they were because they're obviously your, your um, classmates and you're like, and you don't get to, unless you're involved in drama, you don't get to see them doing that stuff. So going to those performances was always like, oh my God, you are bloody good <laughs> yeah and it, and it, it, it also reminds you you were great out on the sports on the netball court they had their strengths and they were able to pursue it in other ways yeah and I think that's why Yarra Valley is so unique because it really finds a way they find the school finds a way to bring out the best in everyone because there is something for everyone and that's what's beautiful about the school is that it, it really makes it easy for everyone to find their place I think as well um, and really explore explore what what they love and what they what they're good at, um, which I think is really wonderful. We certainly work hard to foster the the confidence to achieve, and uh, and certainly in your experience, that's that's what has happened, and uh, and continuing to take that confidence and that achievement into other pursuits as well. You've told us a little bit about how you often would travel home from school or from school straight to netball training somewhere. How did you travel to school? Uh, before I answer that, I just also want to say I did forget confidence is one of the traits as well. That's definitely a big, big one that you have to have to be able to be successful as an elite person. Um, yeah, confidence is a huge thing. And that's probably something that did drop off for me at times and bit me in the bum. But yeah. <laughs> um, uh, traveling to school, I was dropped off. I was lucky. I never took public transport. I was very lucky. Mum and dad have their own business. So mum works from home. So she would always drop me off at school <laughs> and I would get picked up from gate C. Okay. <laughs> Tell me, um, what would, it, what would you find in your lunchbox as a regular? What was the, the sort of normal go-to? I would often have leftovers 
my, I'm Italian, so mum would always cook way too much for dinner and I'd always have leftovers. And whether that be leftover pasta or leftovers in a sandwich or it was always leftovers. <laughs> yes. What yeah. was your first car? A Daewoo Lanos hatchback. And now you drive a Mazda? <laughs> yes. I'm very lucky working for a, an automotive company. Yeah, drive nice cars. <laughs> Your uh, your sporting career has given you the opportunity to, to travel a little bit. Is there a particular destination that you would either recommend to the listeners or one that you've got as an aspiration, somewhere you'd love to go and explore? Mm, that's a good one. I, I got to travel a lot to New Zealand or a bit, not, I guess, a lot, yeah, um, which was always hard because New Zealand is such a beautiful country, but we only ever saw the netball stadium and our hotel and the main street nearby. <laughs> and so there's probably lots of places I've traveled to in Australia and in New Zealand for netball that I would love to go back to as a tourist because I never got to actually see it properly. So yeah, there's probably lots of places. <laughs> for sure. For sure. No, I, yeah. I appreciate that. That's, that's good. What does the motto, our school motto, Lavavi Oculus, do you remember what that means in English? Is it lift up your eyes? Yes. And what does that mean to you now? I think there's a lot of talk now about being in the moment and I think it probably stems a little bit from that, being in the moment, being opening your eyes to what is right in front of you, be there, be here now. But it also... Um, it probably makes me think about being open to new challenges, being open to new opportunities, um, goal setting, like where, you know, lift up your eyes, look ahead to where you'd like to be in five years. I, I think it may, it can mean a lot of things. And I think at where I'm at with my career at the moment, it, it probably means a lot about being in the moment, but then also being aware of where I would like to go and where I would like to be. So let me give you that opportunity, Steph Poopolo from the class of 2009. If everything goes really well over the next five years, what's happening? What does your life look like? Hopefully have a few little kitties around. <laughs> well, Jake and I have uh, um, locked in to get married on the 30th of October, but obviously with the current climate um, with um, coronavirus, we're hoping it's not too affected. Um, we obviously really want to start a family uh, and we, we're very aware of that may not happen straight away, you know, what things are like. But, um, yeah, we, we, we desperately want to be mum and dad. So that's definitely in, in the near future, hopefully. Um, and in terms of my career, um, I, I, it's a hard – I've just recently moved into learning and development from, from a marketing background, the same, same business, So, and I've just finished studying my certificate for in training assessment. So I've sort of started thinking about what my prospects might be in learning and development, but also I love project management. A lot of my current role is about project management. So potentially heading down that sort of side of things. Um, But I would love to manage a team one day. So at the moment I'm part of a team. I don't have anyone that reports to me, but I would love the opportunity to, to be a manager of sorts. Um, what that will look like, I'm not sure, but I, yeah, I would, I would really like that opportunity at some stage. Lots of really cool things on the horizon for you, which, uh, which <laughs> sounds great. Probably too much. <laughs> <laughs> as uh, as we draw our time to a close, and I really appreciate your, your generosity, I wonder if there is a question that you really wish I had asked you, and if there is, what is that question? And then please answer the question. Gosh, that's a hard one. Um, I can't think of. I think you've covered most things, to be honest. I I just. Uh, I just, again, I know I go back to it, but I just feel so grateful that I got to go to Yarra Valley Grammar. And I just think back to, it's funny, you spend your whole time in high school thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in high school forever. Like this just seems like it's going to go on for so long. But then you finish and you're like, I want to go back to high school. That was fun. (laughs) So I, um, yeah, I, and I'm still grateful that I'm still in touch with some of my friends from school and, and yeah. I, I just feel really, um, really grateful that I got to go to such a wonderful school. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Steph Poopolo from the class of 2009, thank you for being part of this conversation and uh, and this uh, Inspired by Yarra podcast. And really we do, we get the opportunity to both be inspired by Yarra, but also speak with people like yourself who are an inspiration to Yarra. So we thank you for your time and uh, for sharing some of your insights and your stories today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. I feel really honoured to be a, be involved and be part of be part of this podcast series so and it's been really nice to reflect on my times at at school and I probably haven't reflected that closely on my time at school for a long time so I really appreciate you having me and and letting me be involved and that wraps up another episode of inspired by Yara and I hope you found that conversation with Steph Poopolo from the class of 2009 engaging informative and interesting by the way for those of you who perhaps were at Yarra around about the same time and you were yelling at your device about who her Year 12 English teacher was, <laughs> I have confirmed that it was Danielle Cooper, English teacher in Year 12, who was an inspiration to Steph. So just a little shout out to Danielle Cooper as well. Yogs, if you are a Yarra old grammarian, we encourage you to stay connected Look us up on LinkedIn and join the group Yarra Old Grammarians Connect because it's great to stay in touch with the wider Yarra Valley Grammar community. And I hope you'll join us again next time where we sit down with another Yog to see how they too have been inspired by Yarra. My name's Paul Joy and on behalf of everyone who helps put this program together, thank you for tuning in, thank you for sharing it, thank you for liking it, thanks for your support. And I want to now wish you another day of inspiration where you get on out there into your day and you make a positive impact in the world around you.